talk. Thanks, Fabrice. Um, it's great to be here. Um, this is a talk uh, that I wrote uh, when I was originally invited to come to Helsinki. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Finland. Uh, and it was only after I wrote the talk that the workshop got its title. So it'll be interesting to see which parts of this talk you can kind of manage to connect with the title. Um, and I'm going to cover a kind of a breadth of things that I've been uh, interested in or involved with. So hopefully amongst the range of things that I talk about, there's going to be some things that make sense for you. So there's a wide scope motivation for the work that I'm interested in, which I'm going to try to present initial, uh, you know, initially. And then there's a narrower kind of scope motivation, which will come afterwards. So the wide scope motivation is the concept of or the challenge presented by the prospect of engineering autonomous systems in some general sense. So these are going to be uh, autonomous systems that are going to interoperate with us in our environment. And that's obviously something that is here. There are organizations and companies that are doing that right now. And then there are other organizations and companies that are uh, anticipating that that is the space that they are going to move into. And for many of those companies, there is some anxiety about this prospect. You know, what exactly is it uh, to engineer autonomous systems? So we know we have smart devices in our houses, uh, autonomous vehicles on our streets, uh, and maybe the prospect of, for example, robots that will care for us when we get old. These are all physical devices. And there are also autonomous software entities that we are interacting with largely uh, illicitly, right? They're pretending to be us, but there are a whole load of uh, software agents that are um, autonomously uh, sending messages to us and to each other. Uh, and that presents something of a challenge. So uh, this is, I'm going to kind of caricature as a crisis. Um, so the best case scenario that are moving into this space in particular engineering systems that are going to interact with people is that autonomy is just a fashionable word that we are using and it basically means temporarily underspecified automaticity it's like automatic stuff that we haven't fully cashed out yet it's, it's just business as usual we just are going to need to work harder at the traditional validation and verification processes and systems that we use when we engineer anything that's automatic. And if there's any residual uncertainty or risk, then we manage that somehow. Maybe we can export it to the vendor, right? They, there's a caveat emptor sort of uh, idea, right? You buy a Tesla car and you're signing up for a certain degree of risk. Um, but there's also a kind of worst case scenario, which is that autonomy actually doesn't mean automaticity. It re means real, actual autonomy. And in that scenario, we don't really have a lot to go on. What, what exactly is that as a framework for engineering new things? What's the nearest comparison for engineering genuinely autonomous systems that are going to take part in interactions with us in the environment? And some companies, at least, that's actually quite worrying. There are people who work for that company who will have to sign off on those systems being sold. And if you sign off on a system and there is something wrong and people die, then there is comeback. Like maybe you go to jail, or maybe you go bankrupt. So that is a reality for engineering any kind of product, but autonomous systems present this kind of extra degree of anxiety. Uh, and at the moment, they, the only real approach is to move into this autonomous systems sort of sector and, and hope that the same uh, kind of get out clause is going to work. Well, not really, right? We need a better way of approaching this problem, a better framing for what engineering autonomous systems is going to be in the sense of uh, the kind of legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks, but also in terms of the kind of design principles and design processes that engineers are going to adopt. So where do we get them from? And one of the things that I found somewhat alarming is there isn't a whole lot that I can see of analysis of what autonomy means in this kind of engineering situation. So I came across this maybe for the first time. I went to a talk by a roboticist called Tim Smithers, really interesting guy. Um, 
um, autonomy, autonomous robots was in the title of his talk. And maybe the first slide or the second slide was this uh, map of the autonomous Basque region uh, at the Spain-France border. And I was like, wow, OK, this is going to be interesting. He's drawing the connection between autonomous agents and autonomous political organizations. You know, where is he going with this? The next slide was a picture of San Sebastian. And then the next slide was the route that he took to work because he worked at the university in San Sebastian. And the next slide was an advert for some postdocs and he wanted me to go and work there, right? So I didn't learn much about a connection between the autonomous Basque region and autonomous robots. And since then, I'm not sure that I've learned much. So within the autonomous agents community, mostly these are multi-agent systems, software agents, Autonomy just means unsupervised intelligence. Stuff that can happen that is good without a human needing to make it happen. But it's left largely unanalyzed. Uh, in the more kind of nouveau AI situated agents community, there's an accent on being embedded in the environment and the kind of uh, sensing and acting uh, that, that being a physical agent brings. And sometimes there is the connection between the word agent and the word agenda. Agents are things that have their own agenda. That's what agency is. And maybe this has been there's an Oxford roboticist who retired uh, a few years ago, David McFarlane. He wrote a book about uh, autonomous robots where he started to compartmentalize this category of autonomy. So he talked about energy autonomy, the ability to have control over the energy that you need as an agent, uh, motivational autonomy. The ability to be in charge of the things that are motivating you, right? To have to have your own aims, to have your own objectives, and mental autonomy, the ability to be able to come to conclusions and decisions that are not just following a recipe that someone else has given you. So this was maybe starting to be useful. You can look to uh, theoretical biology, and there are some interesting concepts around what, where, um, where living agency comes from, but. It is pretty deep water and it's quite easy to get uh, drowned in the kind of deep conceptual morass that these people like to create around ideas. Or you can go more a kind of data driven type route, and there's a whole bunch of measures coming out of neuroscience where you can uh, use basically information theoretic statistics to identify parts of a system that have uh, autonomy or a causal autonomy from other parts. There are these things out there, but none of them were really helping me when I had conversations with companies about engineering autonomous systems. None of these were frameworks that were really uh, enabling, right? Or that could uh, settle the kind of anxiety that some of these companies have. I'm gonna take a moment to talk about a relationship with one such company. So I'm involved in a project for the last few years with a French uh, kind of multinational engineering company called Thales. They do a lot of uh, commercial uh, sort of transport system type stuff, radar, air traffic control, and they also have a, a, a defense side to what they do. And I worked with uh, Angus, so he uh, worked for a UK part of Thales, and the initial conversations that I had with him were about complexity of the engineering pro projects that Thales were involved in and how that complexity often tripped up uh, their projects. So they, he was interested in whether they could do a better job of architecting the kind of systems that they were engineering. That, you know, if, if there was better thinking, a better understanding of the kind of complex ramifications of some of the systems that they were engineering. So for example, they were responsible for uh, re-engineering the tram uh, tram system in a European city and their anticipation of what that uh, project involved basically was not sophisticated enough and deep into that project they encountered regulatory and political constraints that basically uh, uh, ballooned the cost for that project and ballooned the time scale that it was going to take to deliver it and basically they lost a lot of money on that project. Could they have anticipated that if they'd had a more systemic kind of complexity uh, aware way of architecting those systems. So better thinking and understanding might lead to better modeling and architecting, better risk taking and decision making and a more successful company and get, avoiding getting stuck in these problems. And the, that problem that I just described 
is the sort of problem that the, the part of Thales that was interested in autonomy five years ago, they hadn't actually really labeled it as such. I think that was those were the worries that they had. Would we get in with a vendor or you know a, a contract a contract that we would win would require us to engineer systems that we would then discover are actually uh, beyond the, the the financial envelope that we were anticipating. So that led to looking at autonomy as a as a kind of case study for Thales of complex products complex projects that potentially generate problems for them. So they already recognised that they were going to be entering this sector at some point. They were going to stop, be engineering increasingly autonomous systems. And that to start with, they might only be mildly autonomous, but that they would want to go deeper into that. Uh, but they had large concerns about what they called the, the non-functional requirements of those systems. So there's the sort of the technical functionality that the thing needs to uh, deliver in order to complete its mission. And then there's a set of kind of overarching functionalities that anything has to deliver. So things like it has to be verified, it has to be validated, it has to be reliable, secure, safe, uh, and increasingly uh, explicable. It has to be able to explain itself. So those are things that in a lot of research, university research labs, those are not the concern of, you know, there's a group of AI people and they want to make drones that do some smart thing. They're much more focused on the sort of technical functionality than the non-functional requirements are for the business to care about. But actually there are research challenges in being able to deliver those non-functional requirements. So the, the pitch for this TV phase project was, uh, you're funding a lot of autonomous tech development collaboratively between universities and, and, and companies already, but there's a gap, how can we, uh, smooth these technologies to market? How do they become products? And what we did was characterize that in terms of this kind of three R, this R3 challenge. How can you uh, guarantee robustness so that the, the systems actually work robustly? They're resilient, which means they recover. When something goes wrong, inevitably, they recover quickly and without causing too much, too many problems. And then regulation, uh, quite different. Robustness and resilience kind of go together quite nicely. Regulation was this kind of uh, blind spot that Thales had around quite a lot of the potential future markets that they were thinking of going into. Would the regulatory environment be uh, sufficiently positive for the kind of uh, systems that they were thinking about? So Thales and Bristol, where I work, we'd ha they've had some history of working together and the combination of their kind of product interests and our research groups meant that we were in a good place to have a look at this. Uh, and we, so this, this pitch, uh, the UK funding, uh, government funding agency was pretty excited by it and funded uh, five years of work on this. So the first thing that we did uh, was talk with kind of business leads across the whole uh, Thales company uh, dealing with different kinds of autonomous systems. So for example, drones, maritime boats and submarines, uh, ground transport, so like autonomous uh, light railway or autonomous rail systems. And also this, this part of the company, which was, which kind of sits above these uh, domains and is interested in systems architecting, essentially. So their business is, how can we uh, successfully architect these systems before they uh, before we start engineering them. So we had quite deep meetings with those different parts of the company and there was some, and they were actually the people that were in charge of those business units had a lot of very interesting and perceptive things to say about the way that autonomy either would or would not uh, kind of segue into their sector. Uh, and there was a number of insights that we got from those initial conversations. The first was that whilst researchers, universities had been obsessed with platforms, can I get a drone to do something? Can I get a little wheeled robot to do something smart? That Thales and other companies were almost entirely interested in people and platforms, the interfaces and the combination of people and these systems. And that was a blind spot for uh, university research. But they also were increasingly not so interested in what academics would characterize as swarms. So academics in, our, in my area, multi-agent systems, collective intelligence, often the systems that they're thinking about are a large assembly of essentially identical uh, agents. 
So each of these little tiny robots is kind of interchangeable and they do something interesting en masse. But Thales couldn't really see very many situations in which that's what they would be engineering. They were more interested in squads. So a relatively small number of agents that all were quite different, that brought different functionality and that needed to achieve something by coordinating those different functionalities. So this was quite a different uh, setting from this kind of swarm setting. And it foregrounds a kind of heterogeneity, right? So this is a homogeneous uh, kind of uh, population. And this is not homogeneous. These are all very different from each other. Uh, and also, th this, is a, this is a squad which is expected to perform a series of missions over a long period of time. So whereas there tends to be in the swarm intelligence that you tend to just look at one, you know, you, you release your population, it does a task and then you stop, right, and, and uh, assess it. The lifetime of these systems is, is, is not spoken to. So that sort of defined uh, the, the framing for this project. And we were interested in four different sorts of questions, quite sort of typical questions in this sort of multi-agent system setting for the most part. So cascading failure and decentralized decision making are relatively commonplace sorts of uh, problem that academics look at. So things like how do you coordinate a set of agents that have different uh, situational awareness or how do you prevent the kind of propagation of faults and poor information across the system. And then these two are less typical. So life course autonomy was a, a focus on, um, uh, you know, what if these systems are deployed for very long periods of time over which uh, things that assumptions that were made during their design might not hold over their lifetime, right? The environment changes or the way that people interact with the system changes. So an example might be uh, in an in a airport, little buggies. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to get to your gate with your luggage uh, and there's a little buggy that drives past and there's like two uh, people uh, be, and their luggage being driven to the gate and you're like, why I kind of run in with my luggage and they get to ride in a little buggy. So imagine an airport where everyone gets a buggy. It's a little autonomous uh, vehicle that you hop on. It knows where, you know, you scan your uh, boarding pass. So it knows what gate you need to go to and it takes you there. And for the first year, the little beeping noise that it makes as it approaches, it detects that it's getting close to people, that is going to cause people to get out of the way. They're going to go, oh, a, a, a driverless little buggy, and it's a surprise, and they're going to step aside and let it through. But 10 years later, people will have changed their attitudes, and they're not getting out of the way. They know that the thing is programmed to not crash into them, so let the robot sort it out, right? I've got to get to my gate. I'm missing my plane. And that change in the environment around the system, do we know, are we, are we confident, are we certain that that doesn't invalidate the verification and validation that we put the system through 10 years ago? And finally, this is, I guess, the, the, the broader version of this question, which is if we're engineering uh, uh, technical components that are going to operate within socio-technical systems, how do we have confidence uh, about the robustness, the resilience, and our ability to conform to regulatory uh, to a regulatory environment when that is true. A very quick couple of examples of the types of things that we looked at. Uh, feel free to ask me questions about these uh, at the end. Uh, so one thing that we were interested in was could a system that is deployed for a very long period of time uh, alert its users, its handlers, when it detects that the environment has changed in a way that it's worried about. So rather than have to have uh, people in the airport notice that, you know what, we're having some near misses, our little buggies, uh, a couple of years ago, they, they never, there was never any problems, but increasingly uh, we're nearly crashing into passengers. So can't rely on people to make that judgment or, or maybe you can't resource that monitoring function but why can't the buggies do that themselves why can't they have a, a model of what their normal uh, interaction with the environment is and when they depart from that model then they can alert their controllers so we developed an example kind of uh, existence proof using a particular kind of neural network so this is a little environment monitoring robot uh, it's it's monitoring a warehouse and it's building uh, a model of what's normal. And then once it has that model, it, this, this, uh, this particular neural network very readily 
will identify when the environment has changed. So we open one of the doors in the environment and because the, the kind of uh, the time trajectory of its inputs now uh, don't conform to the model that it has built. And so it can alert you that uh, something has changed. It doesn't know whether that change is a showstopper, but it knows that it's uh, departing from its sort of normal mode of operation. So what was interesting, the take home message for this type of work was uh, the time scale over which you let the robot develop its model of normality is critically important. And in fact, uh, the kind of negative result here is there is no time scale that you can pick a priori ahead of time that will do this job for you. So if you if you let it build up its model of normality over the first few days, then the first weekend that it hits is like, OK, something weird has happened. I need to be attended to because there's nobody here. Uh, it's like, well, that's just a Saturday, right? That's normal, but it's only normal over a time scale of seven days. And then if you let it develop normality over several weeks, the first time it hits Christmas, it's like, well, something has gone wrong. But it's like, but Christmas is still normal. Right? So how do you, in a world that has very long time scale cycles, how do you how do you spot, how do you build a model of normality and spot departures from it? it turns out actually possibly that's just uh, going to be impossible. Second little piece of work was whether we can take uh, these non-functional requirements that uh, Thales were particularly interested in, can you integrate those into a standard uh, requirements architecting model? Um, it turns out you can, but because they interact, because the non-functional requirements interact with the functional requirements, you need deep domain knowledge to be able to do this. It can't be outsourced. It can't be treated as a as a separate uh, activity. It's like you, it just is going to it's going to uh, amplify the complexity of your systems architecting uh, phase and that seems unavoidable. Uh, one thing we worked on uh, with a, a student of mine called Matt Potts was some way this addressed Angus's primary concern about project complexity. Could you evaluate project complexity and manage that complexity during a, a project like developing some kind of autonomous uh, robot fleet? Um, so we, we kind of took inspiration from the risk register idea, which is commonplace now, and what would a complexity register look like? So complexity cuts across uh, functions, like if there are multiple teams that are collaborating on something, often the complexity issues are precisely the issues at the interfaces or that cut across those teams. Often it's something that is poorly defined. Complexity is not an easy concept. And so you're having to refine at the same time as measuring things to check whether things are going wrong, you're having to redefine the things that you're measuring. So you need to be in this kind of constant, uh, constant sort of sense making loop. Uh, but we, in this paper, published a tool that enables you to do that. Um, it's actually one of the papers that I'm most proud of in terms of its potential to be directly implemented in an engineering setting. I'll be very, I'll be interested to see whether it, whether there is some uptake from it. I'll be surprised if there is, to be honest. Uh, and finally, we looked at heterogeneity. Uh, so I mentioned before, you know, what if your system is uh, not a homogeneous swarm here? Each of these agents is trying to go backwards and forwards to collect things from a, a collection site and take them home. And they can't get past each other in these tunnels. They can pass each other outside the tunnels. And the number indicates how fast the agents are. The agents are not homogeneous. Some of them are fast, some of them are slow. Could you use that heterogeneity to help break deadlocks and to help resolve uh, spatial interference. And again, there was a kind of partial, all of these stories is, well, maybe, but there are hidden challenges that you need to overcome to take advantage of this kind of generic solution. Uh, and here, designing how you designing the, the mechanism that exploits heterogeneity has to be done quite carefully. So these are uh, more examples of the kind of uh, spatial autonomous systems tasks that we looked at. So this is an exploration task, all these robots uh, have to explore this floor plan. Maybe it's a factory, there's a chemical leak. We're looking for people that maybe haven't been evacuated. Uh, and on the right hand side, this is a herding task. The little colored dots are trying to herd the white sheep uh, together and then into this safe area. And the human is trying to help by deploying and uh, undeploying 
uh, robots in a, in a kind of unrealistic simulation. We're moving those types of tasks, those kind of human robot uh, interaction tasks from on screen experiments to uh, physical experiments with real, very simple uh, physical robots. And that's what we're doing in the last few months of this uh, project. The project culminated in this kind of showcase where we brought together uh, a lot of experts from different parts of human factors and multi agent systems and um, autonomous systems engineering uh, at the first of this uh, perspectives in hybrid autonomous systems engineering meetings, um, which we're hoping maybe will last this. We could maybe have a second of these meetings beyond the end of this project. So the narrow scope motivation, that's all a preamble showing the kind of context of this sort of work. The rest of this talk is going to be about communication. How could we get these sorts of systems, given that there's going to be lots of them and they're going to be engineered by different companies and then they can't really be given pre-existing protocols that are going to enable them to do the communication with each other that they need to. We can't guarantee that they won't need to communicate in a way that we haven't that we have not anticipated. So might we be interested and maybe we could improve the quality of the discourse that we have by uh, improving the communication that these kind of autonomous software agents do. So can we evolve novel agent communication? This is quite a whimsical blue sky question compared to some of the ones that we have looked at with Thales, but it kind of sheds light on uh, some kind of fundamental questions about what we want from autonomy. So there's some history first. This is a nice starting point in the 90s. Uh, Multi-agent systems people were quite keen on claiming that they had evolved communication. Uh, so in this example, we have an agent F and an agent M. The task is to get M to approach F, but M can't see uh, and F can't move. So F can make signals and M can listen and follow those signals. Uh, and that's the only route that they have to be able to solve this very idealized task. So maybe you know, this is somebody who needs to be rescued and this is a, uh, some kind of drone that is going to help rescue them. So F takes in some kind of sensory input about the state of the world and F has three bits of communication that it can use. So it can set the first bit, the second bit and the third bit to one or zero. And M can hear those bits of information and decide what direction to move in. And after a process of adaptation, of, of search for a good strategy, uh, Wern and Dyer presented the, the, a kind of evolved solution that the visual input could be mapped onto this, these three bits of signal, and the other agent could map these signals onto movements such that M could optimally approach F. And they would claim we have evolved language in these agents. Back in the 90s, you could get away with that kind of paper. Uh, but they haven't really, right? They're not evolving language or communication, certainly not from scratch, because they're just allowing some agents to converge on a shared mapping, right? They provided a set of symbols, they provided a set of actions, and all that had to happen was the agent had to stumble on a nice one-to-one -one mapping between uh, signals and actions that achieves the right movements under the right circumstances. So. There isn't a sense in which communication is being created from scratch. If we wanted agents to have the ability to find and innovate new ways of communicating with each other in order to solve problems, this is not it. We would have to have already known in advance what the communication uh, demands were of a setting and equip the agents with them. So Matt Quinn uh, reacted to this with an attempt to actually do something from scratch. So he worked with these little simulated robots uh, so this is a view from above. The robot has two uh, motor driven wheels and it has eight infrared rangefinder sensors. Um, and it's a very, so these were kind of uh, cookie sized uh, mobile robots and you could, that you could simulate them very easily in a multi-agent simulation. So the task here is a little less uh, prescriptive. Two agents are plonked in the world, pointing in random directions, the roughly the same sort of distance apart from each other. And their task is to move the center point between them as far away from its initial position as possible. So if they just set off in a random direction, there's a strong chance that their center point isn't gonna move very far, right? But if they both set off 
in the same direction, then that will move their centre point uh, the maximal distance. So they have to agree on a direction to travel. So they start off uh, pointing in random directions, and the solution that they evolve to, to, to this task is quite similar to a sort of bee-like waggler dance, right? Honeybees do a similar kind of uh, physical communication. So that first of all, they start off rotating. B rotates uh, anticlockwise, and so does A. At some point, B can see A using its forward-mounted infrared sensors, and at that point, B starts to kind of vibrate backwards and forwards in an excited fashion. Uh, and the other uh, robot, they're using the same controller, so the other robot carries on rotating until it can see B, but when it sees B, it sees a B that is excited, right, moving backwards and forwards. So it knows that it was second to that, right? It knows that it didn't find B first. And so it knows that it is the leader. It moves off backwards, B follows it, and that is it. that's their solution for this task. So a task in which they had to, they were challenged to find some way of communicating. They weren't given lights, they weren't given sounds, they weren't given a communication channel to use. They were just given uh, their motion, their ability to move in the environment, and uh, just general purpose kind of uh, visual range finders. So that was quite exciting for the community because it showed that something like communication could arise without a pre-given set of communication protocols, that they had basically built a communication channel out of their physical behavior. But it was still criticized. So there isn't, yeah, we didn't give the agents a predefined set of symbols or a predefined communications channel. But it's not clear that the agents have evolved to use signals at all. Is that is what they're doing really communication? Uh, communication is usually about something. It, and the, that waggling and rotating didn't really seem to be about anything. Uh, what was the meaning that was being communicated? Um, was it merely an example of physical coordination? Was there? Is it, is it very far away from one agent just pushing the other one along? Right? Where's the actual semantics of their behavior? Um, the agents weren't really required to do anything beyond their sensory world, right? If I tell Fabrice that it's it's cold in Bristol at the moment, that's a clear example of me communicating information that is about something, because the something, Bristol, is not here, right? It's the only way, if, Brist if, if Fabrice then did something that was appropriate to a situation where Bristol was cold, I'm not sure what that thing would be, uh, then maybe he has a friend who is flying to Bristol, right? And he phones them up and says, remember to take a scarf, right? Because I've heard that Bristol is cold. There's no way that Fabrice could have done that without a story that is to do with referential communication. Whereas that's not what's happening with these little guys. So maybe we need to give them a more difficult task, a more representation hungry task. And that's what this, this kind of literature then went on to do. So it's inspired by this B dance language, Tanzsprache, uh, which was discovered in the 30s. So bees, when they go looking for nectar, they come back and they dance. They do a little dance in front of the other bees in order to let them know about the nectar that has been discovered. And the dance angle, the dance duration, and the dance intensity communicates the bearing to the nectar, the distance that the bees need to fly, and the quality of the nectar at the end of that flight. So a bee will watch several of these dances and the best dance it will follow that one, go to the nectar. And that's the way the hive collectively um, makes decisions that optimize the, its foraging. So it's quite exciting. Uh, and bees are, you know, they're watching multiple dances. They also use this dance language for communicating nest site decisions. So it's not tied to nectar. They can use the same mechanism to go, I found a really good nest site in this tree. And another bee says, well, I found a really good one in this house. And then the hive decides which one to migrate to and establish a new colony. They also can play football. That's less well known. It's a pretty amazing video. So they have tiny, tiny little brains and they're able to do general purpose cognitive tasks with those brains, including something which is clearly much closer to referential communication, although it's still not, it's not Finnish, right? It's not a grammatical human language. Yeah. Like a, 
presented to like the strength of their like sensory inputs or is it some individual uh, variation? So if they're two bees, they have the same input. This is kind of like intensity, but that's going to be the same. Or is it just a uh, discussion of what the units be or not? Yeah, so I don't know about the yeah. belief, but yes. So that the experiment would be if two bees come back from um, equally distant nectar sources, but they have been experimentally manipulated so that one of the nectar sources is very good and the other nectar source is very weak, then when they get back, the one that had the high quality nectar will vibrate vigorously during its waggle dance. The waggle bit of the waggle dance will be vigorous. The other bee waggles less and the bees watching us are able to uh, decode all three of these components. So they, they can decode the angle, the length, and the waggle, the degree of waggling, right? And they will decide amongst the dances based on that information. So they have to even do some trade-offs there, right? Okay, this is an exciting, that bee is super excited by their nectar, but he's saying it's like two miles away. This one, bit less excited, but it's pretty close. So maybe I go for the bit less exciting one because that's more efficient. So they're doing, they're doing some quite complex trade-offs there. Uh, over this kind of uh, spatially distributed decision task. So could we get robots to do something more like this? So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Beer and, uh, uh, and colleagues wanted to do something like this where it was clear that there was referential communication, not just this coordinated movement, but actual signals that referred to things. So they established an environment on a ring, two robots, the signaler and the receiver, the signaler knows the location of this of a target. The receiver does not know that location, uh, but the receiver and signaler can sense each other's location. So they can they know where each other are, and the task is to get R to this target. So if S behaves in the right way, then maybe R can infer where the target is based on S's behavior. And we limit S. S can only move around in this gray zone because we don't want the solution which may have occurred to you already, which is S just goes to the target and waits there. And R just, all R has to do is go to where S is. So we, we prevent that from happening and we challenge them with a whole series of different target locations. So they have to come up with a general mechanism for solving this problem. And uh, they managed to evolve a solution. But again, it wasn't really obvious that there was any kind of real symbolic uh, referential signaling going on, right? It still looked like uh, physical coordination. So a, a variant on this that we this is the this is the model that we kind of built on. We put the agents on a line. There is a signaling zone. They both start in this signaling zone. There is a target zone. A random target is located in this. One agent knows the location of the target. Uh, each agent has a contact sensor. So if they're close to each other, that sensor is on. If they're within distance D, if they're separated by more than a distance D, then their contact sensor is off. So they have very crude information, right? That's not a very subtle uh, way of sensing the world. They each know where they are. Only one of them knows the target, but the other one has to get to the target. And they're challenged to evolve some kind of controller that can solve this problem. Uh, the Campos and Froza controlled their agents with uh, neural networks. The remarkable thing is, you know, so now people are using deep learning neural networks, thousands of nodes, tens of layers. This is a controller that has three nodes. So each node is fully connected. So there are weighted connections between these nodes. Each node has an activation level, how excited it is. The activation level uh, is controlled by a kind of system of differential equations. This is a sort of standard uh, neural, a standard neuron type update function, except that each neuron has a time constant which governs the rate at which it changes. So that time constant means that we're looking at continuous time, smooth uh, uh, sort of neural simulations. And if this tag value is very big, then the node will uh, respond to its input very slowly. If the tag value is very small, the nodes respond quickly. So you can you build in a kind of temporal uh, ability, which is missing from most feed-forward neural networks. Each node gets an input. So for example, this one is getting the input from the contact sensor. This one is getting the input from the self position. And if you're the signaler, then this one is getting the input from the target position. But if you're the receiver, you don't get that input, obviously, 
that's like minus one. And one of the nodes is chosen to be the output node. It drives the motor. If it's high, if it's excited, then the agent moves east. If it's uh, the opposite, then the agent moves west. So it's a very, very simple, like this is the analog of the bee's brain, right? Ridiculously simple little uh, neural network. But they were able to evolve solutions. So this shows the position of the target in the environment, which could have been could be anywhere between 0.5 and 1. And this, the dots show where the receiver robot ends up at the end of the trial. A blue line is like perfect performance, y equals x. And so there's a large range where they manage to get to, uh, the receiver manages to get to the solution. So they coordinate that joint behavior. And this is clearly a sort of displaced reference task in the same way that when I talk about Bristol, it's something that isn't here. It's I can't just point at the water, right? It's a displaced reference, something that is outside of our sensory perception. Uh, and they use the total contact time as the medium for uh, conveying the information that they care about. This was the starting point for what we wanted to do. I was interested in what, what really is going on here with these signals? What do they actually refer to? And there are different interpretations that you can apply to the evolved behavior. So one meaning of the signals that they're using is the target is at location X. Another meaning is go to location X. In, in English, and I'm assuming in Finnish, those are two separate sentences. We can express uh, an informative uh, sentence and an uh, imperative sentence that tells something what to do. In animal signaling, those two things are often locked together. When a bee makes a dance, it's simultaneously saying the nectar is at location X and go to location X. It's impossible to separate those two things. But also interpret the meaning as move at velocity V. So it's like I'm maybe I'm going to encourage Fabrice to go to Bristol. All I need to do is get him to set off on a vector with a certain velocity, right? Uh, and I know that if he does that in you know, 10, 50, in, in a few days, he will be in Bristol, right? So that's not a displaced referent anymore because I told him to do something now. He just has to keep doing it. Right? So what is, could we, can we separate out what is going on in these signaling systems? We encourage more human-like communication, more of the properties that we've got in human language. We learn about this challenge in the attempt. First of all, we replicate the one-way communication. We successfully to get the same result as Campos of Froza, successfully uh, minimizing the error. This is the amount of error that the receiver uh, exhibits, mapping the goal location onto the mean end position. So that again, you can see the, the line underneath there is perfect behavior. We get very close to it. And this is the property of the signaling behavior, which is being exploited. How much contact time do the two agents have before they move apart? So we can look at that on a graph. So this is time. Uh, the blue, the, the green line is the location of the target. The blue line is where the receiver is. You can see it kind of swerves over here, swerves back again, and eventually ends up at the end of the trial. It, it's at the place where it's supposed to be. In orange, we see the signaler behavior who is trapped in the signaling zone. They can't escape, which is why we get them stuck on this line here. If we Look at, we move the target to a different point. The same system will modulate the behavior of the receiver so that it always ends up at the target. And you can see the signaling behavior is changing slightly. That must be the way that the signaler is, is altering the behavior of the receiver. So what we wanted to do is look at a, a, a two-way version of that. Real bees are exchanging information, not this one-way problem. Our two agents start at the middle of the environment. Each of them knows the location of one target. So maybe agent one knows the left-hand target, agent two knows the right-hand target. One of these is the best target, and that's the target they both need to go to. In this case, it's the right-hand side one. Whichever of the targets is furthest away is the one that they want to go to. Uh, so both must move to one target, but they don't know which one until they compare, right? So they each have the location of one target, uh, and if it was people, then what would happen is we'd, we'd go, what, how, how good is yours? Mine is a 0.7. Well, mine is a 0.9. OK, so 0.9 is better than 0.7. Let's go, both go to 0.9. That's clearly a challenge that's closer to the B challenge and one that is an awful lot more complex than the 
one-way communication challenge uh, that we gave the BEAS to agents before. And the only improvement in their kind of the resources that we give them is we change their contact sensor to a proximity sensor. So now they actually can detect how far away they are from each other rather than just whether they are close or not. But that's the only distinction. So we're able occasionally to evolve a successful solution. It was actually, it's a harder problem and quite a lot of these runs uh, end up with low quality uh, solutions that don't solve the problem. And again, we can represent it with these kind of diagrams, but it's easier to see it in an animation. So here we've got the world that they live in on the horizontal axis and they initially both move off to the left and then they start to sort of dance. And on this side, this trial, the right place to be is the left-hand side target, which is at 0.7 or minus 0.7. And in this trial, the same agents, the same, the same evolved controllers, uh, the only difference is that this target is now at one and therefore it is the best target because it is further away from the origin than the left-hand target. And you can see, the behavior starts off very similar, and then at some point, these traje the trajectories on this side depart from the trajectory on this side, and these two head off towards the uh, correct target, whereas these two uh, uh, head off towards the left-hand side correct target. Look at a different evolved solution, a different evolutionary run to an, an, a new controller. Each agent has the same brain, right? They have a copy of the same brain. Uh, again, these two agents end up converging on the uh, correct target. These two agents end up converging on the correct target on this side. We can interpret this in the same sort of way that I just described how I would solve the problem with Fabrice. You know, these trajectories are the same until around here. That's the point. So maybe they've had their, this is where they decide what's going on. So beforehand, they're communicating, sharing their information. Then they've reached a decision and then they act on their decision and go to the right place. Okay, that's how things would work if we were using human language. So let's look at several different uh, targets. So we're going to release six different versions of these agents with each of them have a different set of targets. So the first two, the best target is over here and the worst target is here. And the last two, the best target is on the right hand side and the worst target is here. And you can see what, what I'm trying to do here is to create this kind of phase space where you can see all the trajectories that these agents follow. And what we had was the idea that the decision is made around here. Beforehand, they're communicating. Afterwards, they're just going to the correct location. But actually, it looks like the decision has already been made here, right? These trajectories have sort of unbundled. The individuals that are going to end up over here have already started on that trajectory by this point, in fact, even maybe early on down here. If we look at many more of these trajectories, I've kind of rotated this, so now time is running along the x-axis, it's starting to look like this. these fibers are unbundling very early. Like we can zoom in on this, you know, possibly you can start to see that the, the decision is made almost instantaneously within the first few ticks of the simulation. So what's going on here is not a, uh, communication phase, decision phase, action phase that we might expect from people, we're still in this kind of physical coordination, pushing and pulling. So right from the start, they're just modulating each other's behavior physically. We're still looking at very limited kinds of communication that are not going to be, they, they don't feel like the kinds of communication that we're going to need in a general autonomous system engineering world. We're still looking at kind of Quinn style leader follower dancing. So we're not looking, you know, the signals that, we're, that they're using are not really symbolic. They're more like analog icons. So an icon resembles the thing that it is indicating, right? So if I was going to uh, warn you that we were being attacked, I might use a very high pitched squeak if we're being attacked from above and a low pitched squeak if we're being attacked from the ground, right? That's an icon. Uh, the signals are holistic. There's no structure to them, not even like the B dance that has these three components. It's just like a holistic signal. And we're still seeing this kind of imperative, indicative mood being uh, allied together. And even the story about displacement doesn't hold up, really. Uh, the, the meaning of the signal 
is not separate from the um, reference. The setting in which the meaning is conveyed is not separate from the reference. So lots of animal signals have these problems, but human language does not. And it feels like going further along this sequence of studies might be a red herring, right? There's this nice phrase, I think, from maybe Mao or some Chinese um, uh, military kind of advice, right? You can't get to the moon by climbing successively taller trees. It, encouraging our robots to solve this style of problem is not taking us towards, uh, you know, grammatical human language. And we, and we can explain that. We can make use of a philosopher called Ruth Millikan, who laid out a set of uh, issues that have to be addressed to move us from a kind of simplistic animal language to a more human uh, linguistic language. Uh, and they involve uh, several things that I'm, I'm going to say that I don't have time to go through them, but I can maybe talk about them during questions. Uh, but they basically all are to do with allowing the meaning of the signal to be extracted from the setting, right? To be instead of being locked to the setting, what we want is the signaling to float free from that and be used in a multi-purpose kind of setting. So we want a new task. The task that I'm proposing and will take forward next with the next version of this project is based on this game Guess Who. I don't know whether this was popular outside of the UK, but it has a lot of properties that are going to help here because. It effectively is a discrete game of fusing information. So our receiver is going to encounter a series of signals, like bees seeing a series of dances. Each signal has a piece of discrete information, like the target has a beard, or the target wears glasses, the target has no hair. And R is going to have to pick the target from a set of possible distractors by fusing the information. And then we can add a wrinkle, which is that the thing that R has to do when they find the target might only become apparent at that point when they know who the target is, right? Maybe they know, okay, this target is a friend of mine, so my behavior towards the target should be positive. Whereas in a different circumstance, they find that the target is someone who's not a friend and they have to behave differently. So what this does is create a kind of discrete and separated uh, signaling game, which is gonna encourage uh, actual symbolic uh, representations of information inside the agents or between the agents, which is what we haven't managed to do so far. OK, In, I've overrun slightly. Um, one thing I think the reason that I was interested in looking at communication is that I think it draws our attention to something that is being mis, um, uh, is being undervalued in the engineering of autonomous systems. We tend to focus on engineering a um, autonomous individuals are individuals that are self-sufficient, self-determining, they can cope on their own. That's what autonomy means in an engineering context at the moment. But every autonomous system is in some kind of network of codependencies. Uh, when we engineer things, when Talis wants to engineer something, it is not a standalone, isolated robot that will never have to interact or rely on something else. It's part of a squad, it's part of a deployment, it's part of an organization, and it has um, uh, duties to that, it has responsibilities. And actually, the quintessential autonomous system that we're inspired by, so human beings, are not, they're not survivalist American rugged individuals who uh, live on their own and can survive by hunting, right? No human can do that. Every human is reliant on its family and society. That's the way that we're built. And it's not just <clears throat> humans, the simplest of organisms are implicitly part of codependencies. That's the only way that they can exist. So autonomy is not this sort of set of kind of slightly uh, crazed uh, sort of, uh, you know, like you imagine some American guy wearing khakis who's dipped a hole in the forest and has like, guns and tins of food there so that when the apocalypse comes they're completely self-sufficient that is not that a natural form of autonomy a natural form of autonomy what we see in nature are responsibilities divisions of labor sharing of materials and information and interdependence rather than this independence so moving towards communication as being a fundamental part of these kind of autonomous systems draws our attention to the fact that we're going to have to engineer autonomous systems that work 
with us. And uh, you can see why, if this is your framing for autonomy, no wonder you are going to worry that the systems that you engineer might operate in a way that is disadvantaged to, uh, to you, right? How would you trust that those systems wouldn't do something that was in their interest, but not in your interest? But real biological autonomy doesn't ever have that problem, right? The, because it comes from uh, collective, uh, collective systems are inherently biological. Okay, so sorry to accelerate at the end there. That is the end. Uh, I'd be happy to take um, any questions. Thank you very much.